Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. We are all more than familiar with haunted houses, where resident spirits reside. These ghosts or poltergeists may be playful or sinister. They may remove objects from the home only to replace them in a different location, or the item may be lost forever in the space between here and the afterlife. But it's not only small objects that are lost. Your beloved pet dog may go chasing into the forest after an invisible stranger never to come out again. Your cat may scamper away in terror at the sight of absolutely nothing and vanish from existence, not a whisker to be found. Of course, we also see on the news people, adults, and children who simply vanish off the face of the earth, no clues whatsoever as to what happened to them. But when is the last time you heard of an entire home vanishing without a trace? I'm not speaking of the occupants of the home, I'm referring to the actual house itself. The brick, mortar, and wood house. Completely gone, seemingly overnight, with no explanation. It's hard to believe, but it happens, and more often than you can possibly imagine. Sometimes, the homes return. Other times they don't. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. There are many cases of haunted houses in the world, ranging from the odd to the truly bizarre. Yet going beyond merely just being the lairs of ghosts and specters, what of those houses that seem to be specters in and of themselves? There have long been tales of whole houses seeming to dissipate from view, to blink into nothingness, often to reappear just as mysteriously. And here, are some of the strangest. One instance of a pervasive tale of a phantom house occurred in the early 20th century in Versailles, France. At this time, two women by the names of Charlotte Anne Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain went for a visit to the Petit Trianon, which was a modest house situated within the Trianon Gardens on the grounds of the Palace of Versailles. There, they experienced a classic time slip witnessing the house as it had appeared in the 18th century, seeing buildings and structures in the area that no longer existed, and even sighting ghosts walking about in antique clothing, including that of none other than Marie Antoinette herself. In the wake of this decidedly strange experience, the two women researched the history of the area and returned to the same house for their investigation. However, when they arrived, there was no trace of any such house having ever been there, 
nor even the path that they had walked along to get there. All they could see were droves of tourists, none of whom had any idea of what they were talking about when asked. The women would write of this strange anomaly in a book entitled An Adventure, but it was mostly written off as mostly a delusion at the time. In the late 1800s, there was also the tale of a phantom house that seemed to randomly warp about in the region of Suffolk, England. On one summer evening in 1860, one farmer named Robert Palfrey was baling hay when he suddenly was overcome by a biting chill despite the otherwise warm air. When he looked up, he claims to have seen a majestic and pristine red brick house surrounded by green gardens looming nearby, which he had never seen before in all of his years in the area. The house then vanished into thin air just as suddenly as it had appeared right before his eyes, melting away into nothingness. This particular house would be seen on and off again in later years. In 1912, Palfrey's own great-grandson, James Cobbled, was in the very same area when the air became frigid, and he claimed to hear a loud whooshing sound, as if a great amount of air had been abruptly displaced. When Cobbled and his companion looked up, they noticed an opulent, three-storied, double-fronted, red-brick, Georgian-style house surrounded by lush, blooming gardens, even though just moments before there had been nothing there but open expanses of open farmland. After a few moments, the house was ensconed with some sort of fog or mist before blinking back out of existence. Then, in 1926, a young teacher and her student were walking through the same area when they claimed to have come across a massive house with a wall around it, imposing iron gates and verdant gardens. When the teacher later asked local residents about the estate, she was informed that no such home had ever existed anywhere near there. The teacher returned to the area with her students the following spring to find that, indeed, the house was not there, and she would say of this, my pupil and I did not take the same walk again until the following spring. It was, as far as I can remember, a dull afternoon with good visibility in February or March. We walked up through the farmyard as before and out onto the road where, suddenly, we both stopped dead of one accord and gasped, where's the wall? We queried simultaneously. It was not there. The roads were flanked by nothing but a ditch and beyond the ditch lay a wilderness of tumbled earth weeds, mounds, all overgrown with the trees which we had seen on our first visit. We followed the road on around the bend, but there were no gates, no drive, no corner of a house to be seen. We were both very puzzled. At first, we thought that our house and wall had been pulled down since our last visit, but closer inspection showed a pond and other small pools amongst the mounds where the house had been visible it was obvious that they had been there a long time. This incident was notably written of by Edward Bennett in his 1934 book, Apparitions and Haunted Houses. Yet another sighting was made by a young man named Edward Bentley in the early 1940s when he was out passing out catalogs along Southall Street for the clothing store he worked for when he came across a large Georgian-style house set some distance back from the road. He called out to his employer, a Mr. Aubin Davies, but by the time he arrived there was nothing there but brush and weeds, with no sign whatsoever of the grand house that had been seen. Suffolk seems to have a good number of sightings of mysterious phantom houses roaming about all over the place, especially in the area of Rotham, and this has earned these spectral dwellings the nickname the Mirage of Rotham. The phenomenon has been reported well into modern times, including as recently as 2007 when a Jean Batram and her husband were driving through Suffolk along Kingshall Street in Rotham, near Bury St. Edmunds, when they spied a stately Georgian house complete with a picturesque blooming garden. On their way back, they wanted to see the stunningly beautiful house again, but it proved to be gone with nothing but a field where it had stood. 
She would later learn of the area's history of sightings of ghostly houses, and Batram would say of her experience, I know I saw this house. I can see it now and could sketch it if I needed to. It was a lovely, big Georgian house with a whole row of long windows and trees at the back of it. I've talked to other people and they've heard of it and people in Ruffham have heard of the tale. I would just love to get to the bottom of it. At the time it happened, I knew nothing about this house at all. I was looking across some plowed fields when I noticed this great big house and remarked to my husband how nice it was. I had a quick look and saw these lovely big windows and then thought I would like to see it again when I came back. But when we drove back, there was no house there. The Spectral House of Suffolk has been covered in numerous publications on the paranormal, including the books Spectral Suffolk by Chris Jenser Romer, Eric Quigley, and Nicola Talbot, as well as Ghosts of Suffolk by Betty Puttick. One theory is that the house is nothing but a fleeting mirage, a trick of the eyes, while others suggest that it is a dwelling that usually resides in another dimension, occasionally briefly popping through to ours. Nothing is conclusive, and it remains an odd, unexplained phenomenon that continues to be one of the more well-known strange hauntings of the Suffolk area. Moving over to the United States, one odd tale of a mysteriously disappearing home appeared in the book The Big Book of Virginia Ghost Stories by L. B. Taylor and concerns a witness by the name of Kathleen Louisa of Falls Church, Virginia. She claims that she had driven past an old manor called the Stone House, situated near Sudley Road, many times and had always wondered about its history. The house was located amongst some of the old battlefields of the American Civil War and was absolutely steeped in history, as well as being a common landmark in the area. One night in 1986, Louisa went out to one of the old battlefields along with her mother and grandparents in order to gaze upon the passing Halley's Comet, but as they approached the intersection where the stone house should have been, it simply wasn't there. The baffled witness turned the car around and was finally able to locate an empty lot where the house should have been standing, yet there was not a scrap to suggest it had ever been there at all in the weed-choked lot. The only thing that remained were the well and some fences. The puzzled witnesses figured that the house must have been unexpectedly torn down or relocated sometime very recently without their awareness, even though it seemed as if the lot of land was relatively untouched and did not display the sort of activity that one would expect from such an undertaking. There was no rubble, no scars in the earth from machinery or vehicles, no holes in the ground, no foundation walls. It seemed to be merely a lonely expanse of land that had remained there open to the elements for some time, the only sign at all that there had ever been anything there that well leading down into the dark. The group milled about the lot for some time trying to figure out what had happened before dejectedly continuing on. Two weeks later, the same group drove by the same intersection and was absolutely baffled when they saw that the house was there once again, as if it had never been gone they all swore that they had seen the empty lot and were equally befuddled as to how the house could be there now. She would insist that she'd been living in the area her whole life and had definitely not made any mistakes about the location. In the same book was another odd story concerning the Stone House, this time with the testimony of a Beverly Kish of Merrifield, Virginia, who claims that in January of 1997, she had her own unusual experience concerning this same structure, which she felt compelled to share upon hearing of Louisa's experience. Kish would say, I experienced a ghostly encounter of sorts in January 1997, but I didn't know about it until I read about the Lady Louisa who said she drove by the location of the stone house and the house had disappeared. The same thing happened to me. I was living in Manassas at the time and wanted to take a drive one night. It was clear with the moon out, it wasn't pitch dark. I was alone, having lived in the area 20 years. I know exactly where the stone house is. In fact, I took a tour there a couple of years ago. Yet on this night, it was gone. 
I even turned the car around and said to myself, that's funny, I'm at the right intersection, and all I saw was a patch of grass with the glow of the moon on it, where the house had been. And you can't miss this house. It's close to the road, so I can personally vouch for what the other woman saw, or rather for what she didn't see. Also in the United States is the spectral house of Cuba Road in Lake Zurich, Illinois, in the United States. The road in question meanders through the affluent towns of Lake Zurich and Barrington, and is already imbued with all manner of tales of the strange with the many reports of inexplicable and eerie spook lights reported from the nearby White Cemetery, as well as numerous specters and ghosts. Perhaps strangest of all is what supposedly lies along a side street called Rainbow Road. The area was previously the home of an abandoned mansion estate that was so expansive that it has frequently been claimed to have been an old asylum that has gates that inexplicably change position. The estate sits right by the infamous White Cemetery, which dates to at least the 1820s and known for numerous hauntings and bizarreness, including phantom vehicles, dancing orbs of light and shadowy wraiths, and one particular house can certainly add to this. It is said that there is a modest shack that occasionally will appear in the woods right next to the cemetery, and which is inhabited by an elderly woman who is sometimes reported as holding a lantern. It is said that if one is to approach the house, it will simply vanish into thin air, with anyone who happens to be too close to it when it does. The house is often reported as being wreathed in spectral flames as well, leading to the theory that it is perhaps a ghost structure that was somehow imprinted onto the area in the wake of a tragedy, probably a fire that most likely took the dwelling's occupant with it. Is that what's happening in such cases of spectral vanishing houses? Have these structures somehow been etched into the location through some mysterious means, as if an image is burned upon film? Can a place have the memory of a house pervading it, or are these instances of time slips in which scenes from different eras become visible for brief stretches? Could it even be that parallel realities are bleeding over into our own, with these houses being denizens of another dimension, temporarily crossing over into our own reality through some thin spot in the veil that separates us? Perhaps it is just mistakes and memory glitches, These are questions for which we have no real answers, and we are left to merely speculate on what's going on with these houses that seem to flicker in and out of existence at will. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. When I was about 16 years old, my parents had gone out of town for the weekend. I stayed home alone thinking I was going to have the time of my life. 
Friday night, I stayed up late watching TV and playing video games. I decided to call my girlfriend and chat. We talked up until about 2 a.m. I was in the sunken living room couch which had three sliding glass doors along the back wall, two of which we never opened. As I was sleeping on the couch, I was startled by what sounded like something breathing right next to me. I tried to open my eyes, but I couldn't and felt paralyzed. I still had all my senses, but couldn't move. Then I felt the hot breath going in and out right in my right ear. I struggled to move with everything I had in me, and finally I was able to. I looked directly to the back sliding glass door we used, and that is where I saw the devil. He was looking at me, standing right outside of the glass door. He was just staring at me and then began to laugh. He looked like the generic devil you always see, red with horns, about six feet four inches tall. Then he just vanished into thin air right in front of me. I grabbed the phone and called everyone I could to come over and get me the heck out of there. I spent the remainder of the weekend at a cousin's house. This is my story. This is in full detail and as much info as I can give. I hope you enjoy and I hope there are answers. It was election night, 2016, and no, this is not the setup for a political joke. And I was laying in bed and about to sleep. I was praying, as I usually do every night, and I was laying on my side facing the wall. I finished praying and I began to slowly sing under my breath to myself as I occasionally did while going to sleep. While I was singing, I got a feeling like I was being watched, and I heard something from behind me. I turned over to see what it was. When I turned over, I saw something that I just couldn't believe, and I sat up quickly in order to stay aware. I saw, in the middle of my room, squatting by my doorway, a humanoid figure. It had red, leathery skin. It was apparently male as it was shirtless and had no breasts. It had no eyes where it should have had eyes. It had these raised ridges of skin vertically up and down its upper face where its eyes should have been. It had no ears. Instead, it had holes like snake ears in the side of its head, and they had these curves like normal ears, but instead it was inverted inside of the head, not out of the head. It had these large hands with black nails like a dog would have. It had huge feet with four toes on each, again with large black nails. It also had no genitals and instead a scar where the male genitalia should have been, like it had been removed somehow. I was panicking and I pinched myself to make sure I was asleep and to no avail, I didn't wake up. I was looking at the creature and I noticed it was looking vacantly in front of it and then it turned and looked at me. And it tilted its head like a dog and it smiled. I'll also add it did not have lips so it had a joker-like smile with these odd inhuman-like teeth. It then did something that I still don't understand. It went invisible as in it turned invisible but I could still see the distortion where it was, like the invisibility effect in Halo or Fallout, the video games. I could see this distortion slowly begin to move towards me, and I saw the carpeting in the room shift as it walked on top of it. Keep that in memory. It got close to the bed, and I started to sweat with fear and clutched my blanket with a strong grip. My bed all of a sudden shifted as if something had sat on top of it, and the blankets started to be pulled by an invisible force. At this point, I began yelling and kicking in the air, and it vanished, and I never saw it since. I left the room afterwards to do something else because at that point I did not feel like sleeping. I considered the possibilities of what it could have been because I am naturally a skeptic, and I always look into everything that happens so I can disprove or prove the existence of something. First, I was fully awake and I could move, so it wasn't sleep paralysis. 
I locked my doors and windows, as anyone else does in their home, so it couldn't have been a human entering with a strange costume unless a door was opened. This was a long time ago, and I think about this moment every day, and I always recall the same details. And I even wrote this down a year after it happened, so if it was a dream, it would have become more vague and harder to remember as time went on. The blankets were still where it was when the creature moved them. The carpet still had the footprints and imprints from where it invisibly moved toward me. I hope you all enjoyed it. I know this sounds bad crazy, but this was my experience, and I still wonder what it could have been. I've researched slightly, and I've only told a few about it, so I don't know what it could have been. Amelia Dyer may have started her career as respectfully as a baby farmer could, but her care soon transformed into terror for the poor infants she took under her wing. Years passed before the so-called caregiver was finally exposed as the ogress of reading, at which point she had claimed numerous young lives. During the 19th century, Adoption, foster care, and out-nursing were normal practices across England. Mothers and families paid these institutions to take in and care for their newborns. Often this was done out of desperation. Impoverished new mothers, unable to afford long-term childcare, would pay the comparatively lower charge to send away their child. Yet wealthier families also paid for such services. Sometimes a newborn was sent away in secret, thus hiding the result of a scandalous or unwanted pregnancy. Other times, newborns were sent to nearby villages to be cared for in their early years, returning to the family when they were toddlers. In a rather well-known example, Jane Austen's family was accustomed to sending their children to a wet nurse in a nearby village for the beginning months of an infant's life. Jane spent more time than usual with her parents in the beginning, but was in the care of a nurse for the first two years of her life. These wet nurses were reputable, a part of the family in many ways, and her mother and father visited regularly. Later, James Edward Austin, Jane's nephew, would write disapprovingly of this practice, though he recognized the value in the outcare system. Many babies who were provided for by a credible wet nurse would survive infancy in a time when this was not typical. But not every institution was on the level. Infants who ended up at baby farms were frequently lost in the system. Others died of neglect, or worse. Once again, working class and single mothers were most likely to fall victim to these disreputable operations. Often they could afford no other option. Q. Amelia Dyer, one of the most infamous baby farmers of Victorian England. Amelia Hobley was born in a small village near Bristol in 1838. She was the daughter of a successful shoemaker and was privileged enough to learn to read and write at a time when the majority of women were illiterate. Later she was trained as a nurse and soon began her adult life as a nurse and midwife. At age 34, she married William Dyer, a brewer's laborer from Bristol. William was her second husband. Her first, much older husband had passed away in 1869. The Dyers had two children together, Mary Ann, who was better known as Polly, and William Samuel. Though she eventually left her husband, and not much is known about her son, Polly became something of Dyer's assistant. Her life as a midwife proved to be an arduous one, and Dyer was not keen on continuing it. It did, however, lead to her next business venture. Her friend and fellow midwife, Ellen Dane, put an idea into Dyer's head. Charging families to care for their infants was far easier and more lucrative than bringing the newborns into the world. Working under numerous aliases, Dyer put out ads in the newspaper offering a, quote, nice family with no children, 
quaint country home, 10 pounds." Unquote. Unwed, desperate mothers responded to this seemingly respectable Mrs. Harding and were thrilled to find a good home for their children. Dyer wrote back, assuring the mother that she would do her duty by that dear child, quote, I will be a mother as far as lies in my power, unquote. Once the mothers were put at ease, the baby and adoption fees were handed over. Regardless of what the mother wanted, Dyer always insisted on a full adoption with no further contact. Desperate, the mothers always relented. It's unclear just when Dyer's operation turned deadly. Records indicate she initially tried to care for the newborns she adopted. At some point, however, whether intentionally or not, the babies under her care began to die. A cruel math then materialized. The quicker a newly adopted infant died, the less money Dyer spent on care, and the more profit went into her pockets. Where Dyer once assisted in the process of welcoming life, she soon felt more content in her role as an angel of death. Eventually, however, one too many death certificates were issued to Dyer. A doctor grew suspicious and authorities were alerted. In 1879, Dyer was arrested. At the time, she was charged with allowing children to die by neglect rather than manslaughter or murder. She was sentenced to six months of hard labor, an experience she later claimed left her mentally ill. Once released, Dyer went in and out of mental hospitals. She also returned to baby farming. This time around, she took extra care to cover her tracks. She no longer called for death certificates. Bodies were wrapped in bags, weighted down with bricks and tossed into bodies of water. Dyer and her family frequently moved through Bristol, Reading, Cardiff, and London, never remaining in one place for too long, never leaving a trace. Until one cold March day in 1896. A bargeman sending cargo up the Thames in Reading noticed a box lying along the riverbank. Upon further investigation, he discovered the body of an infant within. The bargeman called the police. They confirmed that the body was that of a little girl between 6 and 12 months old. They also discovered faint writing on the box that pointed to one Mrs. Thomas and a barely visible address. On April 3rd, they raided that home. Upon entering, authorities were apparently hit by the stench of death, though no bodies were actually discovered on the premises. What they did find, however, was a mountain of evidence. Telegrams about adoption arrangements and letters from concerned mothers inquiring about the health and safety of their children, receipts for newspaper advertisements and pawn tickets for children's clothing, and edging tape used to strangle babies to death. Authorities estimated that upwards of 20 children had been in the care of this Mrs. Thomas within the last few months alone. All told, the death toll may have been as high as 400. Authorities eventually connected the name and address to Amelia Dyer. She was tracked down, arrested, charged with murder, and brought to Newgate Prison where her plea for insanity was rejected. After a jury meeting of just four minutes, Dyer was condemned. On June 10, 1896, Amelia Dyer was hanged outside the Newgate prison. Dyer's disturbing story dominated headlines and soon led to stricter adoption laws. Unfortunately, the baby trafficking did not stop altogether after this horrifying case. Polly, Dyer's daughter, who got off scot-free from any charges after her mother testified that Polly had never been involved, was rumored to continue in her mother's scam after Amelia's hanging. A number of advertisements by a Mrs. Stewart for adoptable babies said, quote, the little one would have a good home and a parent's love and care, unquote. Many observers believed that Mrs. Stewart was Polly's pseudonym following in the footsteps she knew so well.
So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. The legend of Boggy Creek was a sensation in America's drive-in theaters in 1972. But what set this low-budget B-picture apart from countless other schlocky monster movies was a then-unique novelty. It was all true. At least that's what its creator, Charles B. Pierce, claimed. His documentary-style film would probably be forgotten today if it hadn't purported to depict a series of incredible real events that had recently taken place in Folk, a small rural town in Arkansas. People had always seen strange things stalking the shadows around Boggy Creek. The lonely, isolated woodland holds many dark secrets, and in May 1971, a local resident was about to come face-to-face -face with one of them. When reporter Jim Powell first got the call, he could hardly have known he was about to stumble upon the biggest story of his life. Powell had been tipped off that a local resident, Bobby Ford, was being treated at the St. Michael's Hospital in Texarkana because he had been attacked by nothing less than a monster. Ford was at his brother's house sometime around midnight when it struck. The huge, black, Bigfoot-like creature attacked him in the yard grabbing him by the shoulder and pinning him to the ground. Ford managed to struggle free from the beast's grasp and escape with only scratches and a case of shock. According to the Fords, their first encounter with the mysterious animal occurred earlier that evening when Ford's wife, Elizabeth, had seen a seven-foot-tall black figure, eyes as red as hot coal, lurking on the porch outside her window. Bobby and his brother Don, returning from a hunting trip, managed to get a few shots in before the creature retreated back into the woods. Investigators later examined the Ford property and failed to find any traces of blood, but did observe scratches and damage to the house, as well as some three-toed footprints in the backyard. The Ford encounter was only the first of a spate of similar sightings in southern Arkansas that summer, stretching from the Sulphur River bottoms to the town of Folk itself. As news of the monster began to spread, the local newspapers were inundated with more extraordinary tales about what had quickly become dubbed the Folk Monster. These stories did not go unnoticed by Charles B. Pierce, an Arkansas advertising executive and commercials director keen to break into features. Sensing that the sensational stories coming out of the area would make a terrific horror movie, Pierce got together a shoestring budget of $160,000 and quickly filmed The Legend of Boggy Creek in and around Folk in the summer of 1972. The film was a massive hit and became an instant cult classic, grossing a staggering $25 million over 100 times its budget and catapulting the monster to international fame. While hokey and ramshackle by today's standards, the film was influential for its pioneering use of a pseudo-documentary style which gave it a sense of gritty realism, rare at the time. Boggy Creek's mixture of talking heads and reenactments 
can be seen in everything from paranormal TV documentaries like In Search Of to similar breakout horror film The Blair Witch Project, which was directly inspired by Pierce's movie. It also led to a rash of copycat films, such as Creature from the Black Lake and cameo appearances by Bigfoot-like creatures in TV shows, including one memorably unlikely encounter with the Six Million Dollar Man. The legend of Boggy Creek eschews professional actors instead relying on real folk residents who had personally seen the monster, recounting their experiences. Whilst the film is entirely based on real reports, it's hard not to come away with the impression that Pierce embellished some of the incidents to create a better movie. Whatever the case, it remains an affecting and memorable film, living on in the public consciousness through the countless late-night cable TV showings and modern-day remakes, the latest of which, 2010's Boggy Creek, bears little or no resemblance to the original source material. Pierce's film aside, what makes the folk monster unusual in Bigfoot lore is the sheer number of sightings in such a short period of time, making it hard to dismiss as the usual overactive imaginations or misidentified wild animals. Could so many of these witnesses have made a mistake? Or were the residents of folk engaged in a giant collective hoax? Ominously, there are even hints of far older sightings, some dating back to the 1940s and earlier, indicating whatever was stalking the swamps of the Sulphur River was not new or even a single creature, but a population of them. And it wasn't just eyewitness sightings. Footprints were also found and cast, a set of which are now on display at Folk's famous Monster Mart. These footprints, amongst the others, show the creature to be three-toed, unusual amongst Bigfoot sightings. If the monster was a real beast, was it more akin to a sloth than the traditional tall, human-like Sasquatch? And would such a creature even be viable in the swamps and woodland of rural Arkansas? Despite the impressive number of sightings and the footcasts, tangible physical evidence of the folk monster remains elusive. No photographs have yet emerged, and no verified traces of hair, scat, or bones have ever been found. Cryptids like this are notoriously shy, rarely leaving behind any definitive evidence of their existence. But with so many sightings, many from experienced hunters, could the swamp stalker of Boggy Creek really exist? Perhaps due to the film, the folk monster is often written off as a short-lived craze, a self-fueling piece of mass hysteria driven by overactive imaginations but a look back through the local history books reveals strange creatures had been seen long before the legend of Boggy Creek hit theaters in 1972. As early as the 1850s, tales from hunters of wild men attacking cattle and stealing food were quite common in Arkansas. One improbable story published in the Louisiana Caddo Gazette in 1856 even had the beast in question stealing a hunter's horse and riding off with it. But the first recognizable sighting of our monster comes from way back in 1908, deep in the memory recesses of even the oldest folk residents. That year, a large, dark-haired monkey man, eerily similar to what would later be christened the folk monster, was seen by a ten-year-old girl. Eight years later, another black, hairy, man-like beast was spotted in nearby Knight's Bluff. In 1932, a Jonesville man saw what seemed to be the same monster scratching around on his porch before it vanished into the woods. A further sighting was reported to folk sheriffs in 1946, described as walking like a man but not a man. 1955 saw a cluster of new sightings around folk in Jonesville including two motorists who saw a hairy, man-like creature flitting across the road near their home. Shortly after, the Victoria Advocate reported how one huntsman claimed to have got 15 shots off at a large ape man close to the nearby Boggy Creek, but apparently missed. The next spate of sightings occurred in the mid-60s, 
largely amongst hunters. One typical description had the creature at seven foot tall with reddish-brown hair about four inches long all over its body. It stood upright like a man but had extra-long arms. A particularly notable encounter from this time period was that of Carl Finch, the founder of band Brave Combo, who saw a large, hairy, bipedal creature late one night whilst driving through the area with his cousin. What was an interesting personal anecdote only took on further significance after Finch saw the legend of Boggy Creek several years later and realized he had seen the now-famous beast firsthand. These various sightings were intermittent and highly anecdotal, but also persistent and somewhat consistent. For the grizzled old veterans in the sheriff's department, the stories of monsters were all too familiar, shrugged off as an amusing local legend. But whatever was out there in the swamps of Boggy Creek, it was about to break out and achieve international fame. Despite the plethora of early sightings, it wasn't until the early 1970s that the beast lurking around the dark environs of folk started to make national headlines. Shortly after Bobby Ford's hospitalization in early May 1971, the previous trickle of monster sightings started to become a torrent. Route 71, a vast 1,500-mile-long highway that bisects the country north to south and passes through over 300 miles of Arkansas, would play host to many of the sightings. In mid-May, Mr. D. Woods, his wife Wilma Woods, and their friends were driving along the road near Boggy Creek when they saw something strange in the headlights. Running across the road in front of the well-respected local residents was a huge, hairy, ape-like creature with long arms and dark hair. Wilma Woods recounted the story to the Texarkana Daily News the next day. It was hunched over and running upright. It had long, dark hair and looked real large. It was swinging its arms, kind of like a monkey does. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but there it was, she said. My husband turned to me after it crossed the road and asked me if I saw it too. Shortly after, folk gas station owner Willie Smith made an unusual discovery in the soybean field that backed his property. A set of curious three-toed animal prints, alarming in their size, leading away from the garage. These three-toed prints were very similar to the ones found around the Ford property the previous month, indicating they may have had a common perpetrator. Smith's find became a local spectacle, with folk residents flocking to the field to see the prints. A group of them even saw the monster lurking in the bushes that edged the field, perhaps observing the attention its tracks had caused in the local community. Game warden Carl Gallion was baffled by the casts as they matched nothing he'd ever seen before in the area. The prints even made their way to Dr. Frank Shambaugh, an archaeological professor at Southern Arkansas University who somewhat dampened the fervor by suggesting they might be a hoax. If this was the case, then it would probably entail some degree of collusion between Smith and the Fords, as the prints found at the different properties appeared to have a common source. But whether the prints were genuine or not, the sightings kept coming. That summer alone, the monster made dozens of further appearances, almost as if it was auditioning for its forthcoming starring role in the Legend of Boggy Creek film. A red-eyed, hairy creature was spotted squatting near the woods adjacent to the homes of several folk residents. A child also reported seeing the same thing, running into the woods a few nights later. Willie Smith's soybean field played host to more cameo appearances, with a woman and two men seeing a large, six-foot-tall, hairy creature walking along the road near the field. One particularly notable sighting involved several campers at nearby Mercer Bayou. A family preparing their boat for a trip out onto the lake heard a piercing howl followed by what they described as a large Sasquatch-like creature emerging from the woods. Panicked campers ran from the trailers to try and get a shot at the monster, but it fled before they could make a hit. The Beast of Boggy Creek was suddenly everywhere, spotted by folk residents and out-of-state tourists alike. 
Many of these stories were recounted in Charles B. Pierce's film, and dozens more were reported in the local papers. Was this some case of mass hysteria? A collective delusion or an elaborate, all-consuming local hoax? If it was a real creature, then it remained decidedly elusive. Even when a $1,000 bounty was placed on the monster by Little Rock radio station KAAY, the country's finest hunters wielding packs of hounds failed to find a trace of it. Despite this, the reality of the monster had become firmly established in the community. Too many people had seen it to simply dismiss it as a figment of overactive imaginations. The sightings would continue to come in for several more years, although by the mid-70s they had decreased substantially in frequency. But they never truly go away. At least once a year, somebody sees a large, hairy creature lumbering along the edges of the woods or running down the dark highways at night. As recently as 2016, people are still seeing it, or perhaps the son or grandson of it. After all, if it was the same beast all these years, it must be very old indeed, if it is even a flesh-and-blood animal at all. Perhaps, as some believe, the real entity hiding out in the woods and swamps of rural Arkansas is stranger than we can possibly imagine. The aforementioned Dr. Frank Shambaugh felt the three-toed footprint casts from Willie Smith's soybean field could not have been made by an ape-man. Anthropologists have never found any kind of hominid or primate, past or present, with anything less than five toes. Since the monster was almost universally described by witnesses as an ape or ape-man, it would rule out the tracks as genuine, unless the beast was an exceptional evolutionary outlier. Likewise, the casts made at the Ford house, which also had three toes, appear to contradict what the family claimed to have seen. Even other Bigfoot and Sasquatch casts made all around the Pacific Northwest of America always show five toes, making the monster highly unusual in cryptid lore. Only the so-called Honey Island Swamp Monster, also described as three-toed, bears a resemblance. Is it just coincidence that this creature is said to reside very close to folk in neighboring Louisiana? Could the two animals be related or even one in the same? If so, it does not overcome the other objections to the folk footprints. The Smith cast shows a foot that is long and thin, around 13 by 4 inches. This is quite unlike any known species of primate, which invariably have wider feet to support their size and weight. The kind of evenly sized straight toes on the cast are also alien to any species of ape or hominid, who all have splayed, unevenly sized toes. Could the folk monster still be a primate, but one exhibiting mutation or injury? It seems unlikely in light of the number of sightings that had the creature running upright like a human. Beyond the technical objections, scientists rarely value footprint casts too highly as evidence. The casts themselves invariably have uncertain and dubious origins, and cryptozoology has, over the years, earned a somewhat well-deserved reputation for fakery. Indeed, in later years, the design of the footprints found in the area began to evolve to become more conventionally ape-like which naturally raises the suspicion that this was simply hoaxers becoming more sophisticated in their efforts. It certainly didn't attest well for the credibility of a real monster, which would have to be exhibiting a now supernatural ability to grow extra toes. It would be unfair to entirely dismiss the whole folk monster phenomena as fakery, however. Clearly, many of the witnesses who saw some kind of strange animal in the area were genuine people. But could the creature so many encountered be a somewhat less fantastical beast? Bigfoot-like creatures are often dismissed by skeptics as misidentified black bears. On many occasions, the elusive hard evidence that might finally prove the existence of Bigfoot – scat, hairs, bones, DNA – has turned out to be bear. Could the folk monster simply be one of Arkansas's native black bears? 
the black bear is a good fit size-wise with most of the descriptions of the Boggy Creek monster. Weighing up to 400 pounds, the bear can rear up on its hind legs and reach heights of 6 or 7 feet. Many of the sightings occurred at night, in the woods or other rural areas. In the circumstances, it does not seem out of the question that these often fleeting eyewitness encounters were with bears who appeared in the dark to be somewhat more inexplicable than they actually were. Proponents of the folk monster counter this by arguing that black bears are not particularly common in the area, although this might also be a good explanation of why the sightings are relatively sporadic. Perhaps more convincing is the number of hunters who claimed to have seen the beast. Most hunters in the southern states are well familiar with the black bear. Could they really have made such an elementary error and risked the ridicule of their friends by claiming to have seen a monster? There is, however, a total lack of evidence for any other large mammal existing in the area. Nobody has ever produced any bones, hair, scat, or even photographs of anything other than a black bear, making it look like the most likely suspect in our monster hunt. This remains the case in all instances of Bigfoot and his lookalikes, big on eyewitness testimony but low on hard evidence. Perhaps if Charles B. Pierce had not made The Legend of Boggy Creek back in 1972, the folk monster would be no more famous than the countless other cryptid legends around America, and indeed the world. These stories of some long-lost cousin of mankind or ape-man exist in virtually every culture in the world. Do they represent a real flesh-and-blood animal, or are they an intangible manifestation of some ancient mythology buried deep in our collective folk memory? All the questions we have about the mysterious creatures, what they are, how they remain so elusive, and even if they exist at all, will never be answered until we finally meet one face to face. Perhaps, if we ever do so, we will discover they have many of the same questions about us. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>